Hello, everybody. Peter Maravellis here. Welcome to City Lights Live and to our first event of the fall season. And I can't think of a better way to inaugurate it than celebrating a new book by May Lee Chai. City Lights Live is our virtual reading series that began during the pandemic and which continues to feature the works of authors we know and love through readings, discussions, and forums moving forward as we begin to integrate live in-store events into our roster once again. We'll be keeping a fair amount of our uh, events virtual, but uh, our first live in-store event will be in November. So keep an eye on the City Lights calendar for more info about that. As always, we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. As is customary at the start of all of our events, we'd like to take this moment to acknowledge those who have come before us as stewards of the land and offer our respect. Tonight on City Lights Live, we celebrate the publication of Tomorrow in Shanghai and Other Stories by Mei Li Chai. It's published by Blair Books. Mei Li Chai is a brilliant storyteller. And in these tales, we experience the nuances of cultural life in China, the Chinese diaspora, and the world at large. Mei Li Chai is the author of the American Book Award-winning short story collection, Useful Phrases for Immigrants, as well as 10 other books. Her prize-winning short prose has been published widely, including the New England Review, the Missouri Review, the Rumpus, Ziziva, the San Francisco Chronicle, and amongst others. A recipient of an NEA fellowship in prose, Ms. Chai is an associate professor in the creative writing department at San Francisco State. Uh, she'll be joined this evening by Tanya Foster, who is an award-winning poet, essayist, and Black feminist scholar. She is the author of A Swarm of Bees in High Court, the bilingual chapbook La Grammaire des Os, and co-editor of the book Third Mind, Teaching Creative Writing Through Visual Art. Dr. Foster's poetry and prose have appeared widely in such places as the Academy of American Poets Online Journal, Entropy Magazine, Callaloo, Tripwire, amongst others. She is the poetry editor at Fence Magazine and a member of the San Francisco Writers Grotto. Dr. Foster serves as the George and Judy Marcus Endowed Chair in Poetry at San Francisco State University. We're very, very honored to have her with us tonight. So join us now in giving a warm welcome to May Lee Chai and Tanya Foster. Welcome to City Lights. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, thank you, thank you for hosting. This is the San Francisco launch. This is the West Coast launch of tomorrow in Shanghai. Thank you, City Lights. And thank you, Tanya. Thank you for agreeing to be in conversation with me. This is this is a pleasure. Well, I am I'm really honored. I mean, the book is terrific, which I'm really relieved to say. I thought, wow, what would the conversation be if I didn't like this book? <laughs> um, and it is, it's fantastic. There's so much going on. Congratulations to you on this work and on your work before. Thank you. You know, I would love to um, kind of start the conversation by having you talk a little bit about your journey to this particular collection of short stories. Okay, well, um... The majority of the stories, I think all but one, were written since uh, Orange Satan, Donald Trump came into power, and um, since the start of his presidency and then the pandemic. And um, you can see that when you read it, that it's informed by that sense of violence, um, even though in most of the story there isn't overt violence, but there's a sense of like, fear and this this sense of searching and yearning for a safe place to call home and that that's the title tomorrow in shanghai is a metaphor it's the name of the first story but it's also because shanghai traditionally in china like in the 21st in the 20th century and even in the present it has always been seen as china's most cosmopolitan city kind of china's most modern city you know it feels like an aspirational place to live um and so if you that if but it's always tomorrow right for the characters tomorrow they'll be in shanghai tomorrow will be better but that means that right now things are not necessarily so good so even though none of the stories is set in the present they're very much informed by the violence of the present and what i wanted to show like i've got one story that's set 100 years in the future and i've got various stories set you know like a few decades back or a few years back mm -hmm. and it's to show that the violence of the present is related to these 
you know, it's nothing new, right? You know, Trump may have brought it into the mainstream. He have, he may have um, made it seem acceptable um, on his broad on his on the stage that he was allowed to occupy, mm -hmm. um, but it is nothing new. Mm. I mean, it's so interesting how the characters exist within each of the short stories in these in between spaces, right? These spaces where there's an acute sense of their position relative to class, their position relative to a sense of belonging to a space. And so there is something deeply violent. There are different violences visited upon them and also that they participate in. Yes in this way, that they're not just victims of the violence, but they're also participants and at times try to avert their eyes and avert their thinking from what they're agreeing to do, um, which is strikes me as very grounded um, in the contemporary moment. Yes, thank you for pointing that out because I think about like in the first story of the collection, and this was intentional how, you know, my editor and I talked about this and thought about it quite a bit. Um, it's intentional how the stories are positioned in the book and how I want the reader to kind of take up this journey through the book. Mm -hmm. And so it starts with, I would say, the path of least resistance for the characters. And it's a, it's a scene of an execution of the man who is who has been convicted and he is officially the criminal um and he was a blood merchant and back in the day in chinese rural provinces he had traveled and he had purchased blood and he'd run a, a mobile blood uh purchasing uh business um and he inadvertently infected hundreds of villages with the hiv virus which is based on truth right this really happened in china but when he did it just as in real life, it was legal. It's a legal job that one could have. It was perfectly legal. He didn't know, he didn't have the science background. He didn't know that this could happen and it was not something um, that he was doing of intention, but he will absolutely pay the price and he will pay the price of his life. Meanwhile, in the same story, we have you know the officials who are overseeing the execution and we have a doctor who is taking the side job, extracting the organs of executed prisoners to make some extra money for his better life, right? That will happen tomorrow in Shanghai. And so, you know, he didn't create this system. He didn't create this, you know, unequal law, but he's also the path of least resistance. He's not resisting it either. Mm -hmm. And so, but from there, from that story, um, I want to show a path towards active resistance. And we still, like in the last story, which takes place 100 years in the future on a, a Chinese uh, colony on Mars, we have an older Chinese working woman who is serving as a nanny for some people in New Shanghai. And she does not have a lot of power in society. She's heavily indebted. Um, they've taken her huko as a mortgage, so she can't go back to, you know, to Earth until she she's working in her contract, but yet she still exhibits a lot of agency and is always looking in her in her life ways that she can resist these kind of oppressive forces. And that was intentional. I wanted it to end on that kind of note. It may be, I don't know if it's hopeful, but it's um, I, I think it's I think it's more encouraging. Well, I would say it is hopeful because there's there's also the line through the collection about value and debt and lineage as well. So it's interesting to me that it ends on the kind of consideration, someone who's taking care of other people's children for money, mm -hmm. when so many of the characters are concerned about how are they going to take care of their parents and what they can borrow from their parents. And what will, like even in that first story, there's the concern about where are his parents? And then there's all kinds of, speculation about what will happen to the parents and the son because he's a criminal right um and so this this real engagement with the question of both value as it relates to the marketplace 
but also the other kinds of values that are about relationships to people and belonging and connections and things that give your life value. So I, I was just gonna say, I find that I, I'm, I, it's an astute observation. I hadn't really thought about that per se, but um, like, I mean, like I didn't hadn't realize like everything is about the families and the positionality within the families. But in the center story of the collection mm-hmm. is a story called Jia, which means family mm-hmm. and in, in Mandarin Chinese. And um, the word for family in Chinese also is the word for home. And there's also since the Chinese nation is the word it's guo jia and it's guo is state and jia is family. So that's what that's what the country is, right? It's a state made up of families. And that's kind of like the basic unit of Chinese culture is the family. And so, you know, thinking from a perspective from Chinese culture and Chinese and diaspora, you know, your family is is your home as you've got to shore it up. And sometimes it's not a safe home. As many of the characters find, right? There's also, for several of the characters, a feeling that their family is inherently unsafe towards them. Mm-hmm. And it can be for a number of reasons. You know, it could be gender, it can be because of sexuality, it can be because of just differences in generational thinking, patriarchy, you know, uh, <laughs> always, always can be a problem. Um, and that that was intentional as a theme to show the kind of like the nature of family as being supposedly your home, but not always safe. How is this collection? And I I haven't yet read the earlier uh, collections. I just got your memoir, um, which I'm excited to sit with. But what's the, not just thematic shift, but is there a shift in how you imagine the short story work? You know, there's um, like, like for useful phrases for immigrants, which was the previous collection came out in 2018. Mm-hmm. I wrote those all pre-Trump, you know, and, but I put the collection together just as uh, Trump was running for president. And I felt an, an intense sense of urgency um, and I thought, you know, oh, I didn't think, I never imagined, because I'm just naive in that way, I didn't think he could win. But just the way he was running his campaign and the way the media was, was giving him this platform with his, ha- with his hate speech and just repeating it verbatim. And then reporters, at least that we could see on the national media stage, were not calling him out for lying. We're not calling him out for inciting hate. I remember him saying, you know, Mexicans are rapists and China, China, China is raping us as a country. It was despicable. And so I put together useful phrases um, as my act of resistance. And I, you know, I, I, I thought, you know, well, he won't win, but this toxic poison has been put into our system as a nation and we're going to have to counter it. So um, it was perhaps a more optimistic collection Um, And there were, you know, different kinds of family stories and different types of traumas, um, but not, but it was still kind of, I feel like more um, expected, like they could be more triumphant and there was more, um, um, I don't want to turn people off this collection though. So it's not like this collection is sad. No, it ends on a high note, but um, uh, it's actually very subtle. It's, it's, I don't think it's sad even the stories that are where painful things happen that there's such a um it's not cataclysmic right it's Mm -hmm. the kind of daily traumas of what it is to move between cultures and be in a space and that's really weird to say daily traumas but but no, you're right. It's the, it's about the microaggressions, right? That you just, the people who, the people, almost everyone in certain, depending on what your background is, what your culture is, how you are minoritized in society have to deal with, and but you have to deal with it, right? You can't, you just have to deal with it. You can't give up. That's not really a good option. So it is about that dailiness. And I really liked how the reviewer, Cassandra Landry, in the Chronicle, Mm-hmm. Um, saw it as being um, just actually kind of optimistic because because I don't kill off 
you know, these characters, they're facing it, but it doesn't, it doesn't destroy them, right? They're able to find a way, except for the first guy, because the prison, the incarceral in prison state everywhere is terrible and unjust, but um, people find a way to make, to deal with it and to continue to live their lives despite it. You know, this is really interesting. I was, um, one of the things I did today, and maybe you'll see how this is related. Um, I watched, I didn't watch Serena uh, Williams' uh, match at the Oval, right? Which she won. But I listened to her interview afterwards. And then I read this thing in which the number two seated player talked about crying and how and that she burst into tears in her interview because she said the crowd was so with Serena and I thought (laughs) if Serena had burst into tears after every time crowds were harassing her and against her she would never have she would never have continued playing tennis I, thought, I, I think of that going on. I have to say, when you first told me that anecdote, I thought you were going to say she burst into tears because she was so moved by Serena's, you know, game, right? Because like, if you're in, if you're in tennis, like that was amazing, right? Yeah. She is, she is a goddess. She's amazing. I feel like Naomi Osaka when she defeated with Serena, right? Like that she actually cried because she didn't want to defeat her. She, this is her idol. Right. It was her idol. And I, that's why I feel like, you know, she cried because it was so wonderful to see Serena do that. You can give your best game because that's how you respect somebody. Right. But um, I'm disappointed that, that the opponent would say that. But perhaps well, not. I'm not surprised. Into, well, but there's something about, I think about your characters. And when you talk about surviving the daily traumas or the microaggressions that it doesn't destroy you where for others it might be because they don't have to live in that reality it may be um it's the first i don't know they yeah they don't have the muscle from having to deal with it and so when encountering for the first time in a privileged life, something that didn't go exactly their way, it can be seemingly crushing. It's amazing to see, is it not? (laughs) Yeah, it is. I mean, and maybe that's why, like, I don't even think, I I hesitate to, to use the word optimistic because it assumes that one is optimistic or pessimistic. Um, and sometimes it's the it's the will to go on anyway, and that just is what it is. Um, and there's something in this work that understands that. I'm hoping that you will read. Um, Would you read from the middle story? Oh, read from the middle story, the jazz yeah. story. I could read yeah. from. I could read from that. Um, let me see. Fine. Okay. Okay. I will let me see if I can cut my right glasses on. Okay. I will try to read it, see if I can visually see my text with these computer glasses on. Okay. So this is called Jia, and that means in uh, Chinese, uh, both family and home, which is one of the themes of the story. Mom grabbed her jewelry box and her suitcase and her purse and then took Lulu by the wrist, announcing, I've had it. We're leaving. We're going back to California. I want to see my family. Mom ordered Lulu to get in the car and then back down the driveway fast, fast, fast. Their tires even squealed a bit and then they were driving away. But I didn't pack any clothes. We'll buy you new things. We don't have any money, Lulu thought, but she did not speak up for fear her mother might change her mind. It was exciting to be in the car, driving, the idea of leaving, leaving dad and the house and the fighting, the shouting. Lulu's school with the girls who stared and wouldn't let her sit at their tables at the lunchroom. Lulu didn't remember California. She'd been born there and then her parents had moved to the East Coast when she was still a toddler and then again to this small town in Indiana, but she was ready to go. Mom never drank when she drove. When mom drank, she just stayed in bed, complaining that her nerves were shooting sparks through her body. 
Lulu pressed her feet against the floor mat as though she had secret pedals on the passenger side that could make the car move faster. I miss California, Mom said. I never wanted to leave. Your father put up such a fuss. He said, you are holding me back. You are ruining my career. Mom cried, tears dripping off the tip of her nose. She wiped them on the back of her hand, pulled a crumpled tissue from the pocket of her coat, dab, dab, dab. But what about my life? She said this louder than Lulu expected, a wail. They used to travel every summer up and down the coast when Lulu was very small. They'd gone to Washington, D.C. to see the museums on the Mall and the Lincoln Memorial, all the way to Monticello in Virginia, another time to Fort Cond Ticonderoga in upstate New York in time for the bicentennial. Mom was afraid of flying, plus it was too expensive. They stayed in all the travel lodges, the Hojos and Super 8s and Motor Inns and motel chains so small, no one else had ever heard of them. Dad snored and the noise amplified by the smallness of the motel rooms used to drive Lulu crazy. She couldn't sleep listening to the deep inhale, the pause, and the tea kettle whistle as he exhaled loudly through his nose before the final gentle poo sound he spat from his mouth. How can you stand it? She asked her mother once. Oh, I got used to it, Mom had shrugged. In those days, it was her parents' restlessness that drove the family. Lulu sat in the back seat of the car with her books and her dolls, ignoring their fights as they drove in circles, lost on the interstate, trying to find some new famous place they needed to see as a family. Once, when Lulu was seven, they drove all the way to Vermont with Yeye and Nai Nai in the car. Mom had wanted to see the autumn leaves. They normally didn't travel so late in the season, but Dad had agreed. He must have had some kind of break from school. They picked fragrant apples in an orchard and ate them as Dad drove. Yeye removing the peel in a single long red thread with a knife. They all marveled at the whimsical signs shaped like black and white cows, the roadside stand selling fresh produce, buckets of yellow squash and orange pumpkins, the barns red as firecrackers against the green fields and the clear as water blue skies. Nai Nai had laughed with delight, exclaiming in Chinese and English that they'd somehow stumbled upon the Jian Shi de Mei Guo, the real America, the America of old black and white movies and history books, home of the blonde, blue-eyed Americans that they rarely encountered in the city or Jersey. It had been a magical trip, and it had given Dad ideas, a sense of the bigness of America. Why live so tight and small with this big, vast country out there? The next year, Nai Nai died, and then Yeye grew frail and frailer. He couldn't sit in a car for their trips anymore. He couldn't live on his own. And then they went to live with Lu, and then he went to live with Lulu's uncle back in Taiwan. And so that's the start of this story about family. And as you will see, the family then they end up moving, and they're looking for that big, vast America, right? And so they end up moving to a small town in Indiana. And they get their nice big house and they're like, you know, yay, can come back and move with them, but he doesn't come back. And then their neighbors are not so pleased to see them. And so their neighbors, you know, someone keeps dumping trash on their lawn. And so Lulu was following the father around as he's picking up the trash off the lawn. And, they're, and she's looking at them wondering, which one of the neighbors did that? You mm -hmm. know, which one of them is treating this way? Um, and so that is, like, and, it, and then it goes on and you can see what happens. And then the character of Lulu, I ended up doing two stories with her. Um, and she ends up in a, in a later story um, as a as a 20 something young woman living in uh, China and working there. I mean, and there's something this sort of, well, you've talked about it, the violence and threat of others who are in close proximity to you. Um, is throughout this collection and that you have to kind of watch them because you don't quite know what to expect. Um, and I found that probably the most painful part of, of reading the stories, right? That sense that um, Not only, I, I mean, I'm not even quite sure yet what to call it, because I have to, I really have to think about this movie. But there's something about the incredible discomfort in the presence of others who are slightly other, who are other, otherized, as if they're weatherized, right? So 
this is this is a strange question, but I'm gonna how do you write into that? That, that feeling of being othered. It's was, you know, there's a lot of um there's a lot of stories in which someone is being judged by their appearance, right? And by how they sound, by their and accents. By their accents, by whether, and then the people, then, and you know, but it's from the point of view being judged. It's from the point of view of the person being judged and feeling this judgment mm -hmm. and wondering why the heck are people treating me this way? Why the heck do people see me this way? And so it's like about this kind of like trying to understand what seems in, incredibly bizarre, mm -hmm. right? That's, and I feel like that was important is to center that point of view, because I think we often see in Hollywood depictions of racism in which we basically see the oppressive racist view. Right. And so we're seeing the view of like the character who's who's being attacked. We see them through that lens and then they're just a victim as opposed to the person living this life and thinking, like, you know, who is doing this? Who is doing this? Why are they doing this? And right. I think, and that was very intentional. You know, I feel like for me, that's the safe space to write from. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I feel like that's an important place to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that comes, I think, in this collection is a reaction to, frankly, some of the anti Asian violence that we've been facing since the start of the pandemic and that, you know, Trump drummed it up, but it's Right. always been here right we know from the earliest days of america there has been you know this is a country founded on genocide and slavery so this should not be a surprise there's been these attempts to categorize people by certain characteristics that are completely different from how people would categorize themselves right. and so um i was thinking you know just with I myself have had to report 11 incidents to um, stop AAPI hate, and it's just been such an onslaught. Wow. And um, so it's reminded me, frankly Can speaking- Can we pause for a moment on that? I'm really, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I feel like it's really important. Now, you just said I had to report 11 incidents of anti-AAPI violence or incidents, right? And yes. you're talking in the space of what time? Oh, I would say two years, from March 2020 till the start of 2022. Right. So maybe that's, what is that one? That's actually, it's almost three years, but a little over two years. Um, and it's been, you know, and like one incident, like my father and I were chased at Ocean Beach. I my father's disabled. He's 89 years old. So, but I need to take him. I, it's not safe really to walk where there's a lot of people. So I try to find like a semi secluded place where there's a lot of air. So it's safe for him to walk. And we were at Ocean Beach, even though there were lots of other people around, but just not close by. And some, a white man came running up, screaming at us. And he started screaming like really like xenophobic and ableist things at my father. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I had to, you know, like, I, you know my father walked at that point with two canes. Um, and so it's, he can't walk faster than he can walk. And so um, I got him to the car and then we, we got to safety. But then a few days later, I had to take him um, to have an EKG because his, he just he, he was so terrified by this. Like his heart rate had just gone up and it just, it didn't end even though it ended, right? Um, it just, it was, it went into his subconscious. And so then um, we've never walked on Ocean Beach since. We haven't gone back because he feels such anxiety about it. Um, and, you know, several of these stories were, even though they're not set in this present, they're very much inspired by these incidents. I have one, um, you know, not just mine, but um, like the final story, The Nanny, is about the older Chinese woman who is taking the ultimate migration, you know, for work and gone to Mars to this Mars colony. And it was inspired by the older Chinese women who have been attacked pretty right. much nonstop since the start of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And there was this one woman in San Francisco, some of you may remember in um, on Market Street, I think it was Sixth and Market, and a young, youngish man came up and just punched her. And she picked up, found some debris on the ground and smacked him back in his head. And, you know, and, and was able to defend herself. But then when the paramedics came, you know, someone called 911 and when the paramedics came, they took him and left her, left her on the side of Market Street. 
because they couldn't understand her because she spoke toy wow. dialect mm -hmm. and i just thought like oh my god right mm -hmm. and this is san francisco this is san francisco and this is happening so you know i wanted to write about that and so for the longest time like i already had the book under contract and i wanted to write like you know a story that would somehow address that and i just couldn't bear to do it because it was just so painful to think about and then at the same time you know there's like the smaller violences i was you know i was reading next door which you should never do right it is just it is a dumpster fire it is so terrible but i was i was taking these screenshots and sending them to a friend and we were like you know just hate reading together and it was at the start of the pandemic and all of these people were, were talking like sharing nanny ads basically mm -hmm. Ooh. and it's like this is like you know it's like it's like and they actually call their nanny nanny and i was like wow i didn't realize people did that and and so they were talking about well i need i need nanny because you know we're going to be leaving the city and we're going to go to our you know they have a second home somewhere and so you know we need we so we need nanny to do this but she won't have to be a maid you know we don't need you know we don't need maid work and then they start listing all the work that she's going to do and that's definitely maid work you know what i mean she's not just looking after the kids she's preparing them multiple meals and i'm like how many allergies do kids two children have they all need like these separate meals and then she's going to be living them. And one ad they wanted, not only did they want this person to look after their toddler, but they wanted the, the person to sleep train their infant. Wow. And so, um, so that is, then I thought, okay, now I've got my plot. I'm going to, I'm going to get, I'm going to tell a story from the point of view of the nanny. Right. And, um, and so that is where the final story came from. And it's also like a way of addressing this kind of violence. Um, that has been falling upon older Chinese women working in America, working class women from coast to coast. Mm -hmm. um, and this is kind of my way of centering, centering such a woman. And we live through her, uh, see the world through her eyes and her experiences, because otherwise I feel like even the way it's been reported in the news, it can be very, it can be very um, objectifying, very mm -hmm. condescending, and very um, dehumanizing. Well, I have to say there's something, um, thank you for that explanation. There's something, there's a lot that's incredibly powerful and moving in what you're describing. And one question I have as your, as your new colleague is how that um, emphasis and um, really centering positionalities and perspectives that are otherwise dismissed or assumed known already. How does that impact your teaching? How does that impact the work you do in the classroom, um, the work you do as the new chair? How does it, how does it impact what you think writing can do? And well, that's something profound about your not looking away. Because I think so often there is the idea of writing as well. I want to, you know, feel something else about the world. And you're engaging the world um, and imagining something uh, that is firmly rooted in the experience of this world. Well, thank you, Tanya. I was going to say, like, I hope that I am the fiercest advocate for my students. <laughs> that is my goal, because I think, you know, as you know, we have fantastic students at San Francisco State and we have a very diverse program in every kind of way from class to race, ethnicity, to sexual identity, to gender identity, to um, just, you know, writing styles and I and I feel like we can build a community that is nurturing of all of these differences rather than trying to sand off everyone's corners and try to make everyone bland and blend in and fit in to some kind of like mainstream model which is frankly violent and repulsive you know so um one of my proudest moments came just like just before the start of the semester when a former student of mine Norman Antonio Zalea um, published his second book and he invited me to read with him and we had an online reading and I, I, I taught Norman way back when I was a visiting lecturer 
1999. And we've kept in touch and I'm just so happy now he's got his second collection of short stories out. And I feel like, right, this is why we do it. This is why we do it. And he's writing about the mission and he's writing about the mission from the point of view of, you know, this is his neighborhood, this is his home. And he is casting light and centering voices in his community that otherwise are being completely silenced. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, so that is like the goal that I have in my classrooms is to give my tools, my students tools mm-hmm. and inspiration to find the way that they want to center their voice in their communities and to fight mm-hmm. back and to resist this kind of really homogenizing violence that we find in corporate publishing, right? And we can push back. We can be pushed back and we can succeed at pushing back. So his chair, I've just started his chair and I had like, oh, just, you know, as every former chair will tell you, it's a whole lot of meetings and emails <laughs> and forms and just tracking down forms like, oh my goodness, but that's you know what the bureaucracy wants, right? They want to take all of our energy and our time um, so that we can't really if effectively make change. So as you know, we're working to try to create um, spaces and a program that can bring in even more more different kinds of voices and I'm going to like I haven't had time because it's only been two weeks and there's so many forms but we're going to try to bring in also opportunities for students professionalizations and like like lectures and things on how do you pitch how do you submit your work where do you submit it how do you know how to protect your work right when you are submitting it things like this that will be empowering for their voices um I don't want and I know my all my colleagues would not want this either because this is not part of our mission. I would not want our students to change their vision for themselves and for their writing to try to fit into some other model. You know what I mean? Yeah. Thank you for that. And your students, thank you, I am <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, um, what, this is, this is a strange question and I'm trying to, we're okay for time, sort of. What's next? Um, for like writing? Yes. Well, I can't, re- I can't, I mean, oh my gosh, I just finished this and now I'm promoting it. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> okay, just to get through forget this. Forget the question. Forgive the question. <laughs> forgive the question. Um, so why, why science fiction? There's also, there are various things. I think about your use of um the negative or what's not there that there's the the sort of inflection of the narrator to say there is no conversation about these things or he does not say this or this doesn't happen um and i wonder about that narrative impulse what does it do in the text and how is it, I'm asking this question and I have my own sort of suppositions about what I think it's doing. There's some way that there's a continual pointing to the disappeared. Thank you. In this work. I'm and so, the- I'm just so like thrilled that you saw that and you, are, and you articulated it just so perfectly, far better than I ever could have if I, you know, you'd asked me to try to explain what I'm doing, but I'll, if there's a line I, that you made like in the first story, tomorrow in Shanghai, mm-hmm. and this is how it opens. Um, Zhang Xiaoping would not have considered himself a bad person should anyone have been given the opportunity to pose such a question to the prisoner. In fact, if asked by anyone other than the court appointed defense attorney whose main function in the trial was to enter Zhang's guilty plea, the prosecutor and the panel of three judges who had found him guilty and sentenced him to death, very few people who knew Zhang would have said he was a bad person, wicked, evil, corrupt, a lowborn thing, a turtle's egg, a non human devil whose crimes would merit the ultimate punishment. So you're right, it begins in the negative, right? You hear all the things that, well, if they had been asked, this is, no one would have said this. And so by implication is they were not asked and no one cared what they had to say about him, right? Because it had already been predecided that he was evil, that he was a lowborn thing, that he was corrupt, that he was guilty. And, mm-hmm. you know, and he's not been posed the question to even explain himself. So, I mean, that's, that, is, that is what I'm thinking about, the questions that are not posed, the voices that we don't hear, the mm-hmm. stories that we're not told. 
right? And what also, in some stories, what is withheld? For instance, he did not tell them that the rooms were unfurnished, like the litany of things he wouldn't tell them. And that there's something about that that is doing, I said it points to the disappeared or the absent, but it's also a way of pointing something, it points to the kind of structure of things, right? Where do we not raise those questions and what is withheld and why? What is being held up in the holdout? Um, and so that's been really interesting to, to think about just in terms of craft, what's the effect that's produced through that accounting for uh, things that have been absent. Um, I love how you put that, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So it's also, I'm rethinking that claim that, um, that claim that there's, that it's not optimistic because my first thought was tomorrow in Shanghai never comes, but it's the idea of tomorrow in Shanghai that's sort of held out for me. It's the hope. Tomorrow in Shanghai, even though it seems like, you know, this first story seems very grim, but I want to give a sense that there is hope. Like the police are looking for his parents, right? They're looking for his son who have escaped because okay. they're going to try to get the whole family, right? Because family, again, is like the basic unit. It's your safety, it's your home. If they can get his family, as they say, people who, you know, they could cause trouble later, mm -hmm. but they can't find them. I gave that away. Oh, well. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And they're not really interested in, I mean, you know, they, some they, of them are not interested in finding them so much, you know, but. The people in the cities, they have other bigger problems to solve. Right. And so, and so that is, again, that's the wiggle room that people who seem to have no power have, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the people with power can be negligent. They can be distracted. They can use their power for, you know, things that we can slip by and we can find power and a way to survive that way. Wow. Nice. Well, are there, before we, um, do we have, to, we have to turn to questions. I've been Tricky. terrible at watching the clock. So I, I and it's, it is, it is actually know me know that <laughs> I have a peculiar relationship to time. Um, <laughs> it's perfect timing, actually. It's quarter till. So Peter, I know if Peter will come back and he we can we can take questions both for me and for Tanya. This is meant to be a conversation. So you have a if you have questions for Tanya, please also put them in chat. It's nice to see yeah. you again, Peter. There is quite a bit coming through here. It's a lot of engagement tonight. So let's see. Um, this is from Ryan. I appreciate your focus on topics like Mars colonization, given the rich people talking about it, given the quickness with which these events happen. How do you hold on to that thread that keeps the story resonant? That's a great question. Oh, um, because it could be outdated soon. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I saw Elon Musk, like he was tweeting something about his ideas for a Mars colony. I'm like, I'm like, oh, well, I, I mean, I wouldn't want him to build a Mars colony because, you know, it will not work and it'll be terrible. Um, and it would also be like very exploitative. But it was actually his, um, I'm trying to drop my phone. It was him and Bezos and that Virgin Atlantic guy blasting up in their little private like i didn't even know people could build private fake rockets and go up to the upper atmosphere and spend you know god knows how many hundreds of millions to pretend to be astronauts until they actually did it and i thought man we are not headed for star trek are we we are this is going to be like they're going to make build some giant colony amazon warehouse plantation in the sky if we don't stop them so that's kind of was the backstory that's the, that's that's exactly the idea of Mm -hmm. of like what might they build and then how can we resist that yeah. i'm going to uh, shamelessly plug an event at the end of september called deconstructing oligarchy where we actually <laughs> we talk about a lot of these things but there's another question this one's from scott 
May Lee, at the beginning of the hour, you mentioned discussing and shaping this book with your editor. Wondering what the role of editors in general has or has not been in shaping your 10 plus books and keeping your vision so fresh and flexible, the legendary Malcolm Cowley idea, the privileged editor and power and bias roadblock, all of the above. Nope, neither, question mark. Oh, oh that's a great um, question to think about editors. Like, I mean, this is why I wanted to do, I was willing to do another book with my press player because I really love my editor, Robin Mura. She is, um, she's just really smart. She studied journalism at UNC Chapel Hill um, before she became um, an editor at a publishing house. And so she has a really great social justice lens. Um, and then she also really good muscular sense of how to tell a story. And I like that because I think it, I think it works. We work well together um, and we under and I think she understands what I'm trying to do. And what I like also is that she has like she's a really sharp eye. And she asks the right questions, but she has a very light hand in terms of of like change. I, she doesn't change my sentences, right? She doesn't make me write a story in a particular way to reach, I don't know, some imaginary audience. Um, and so that's what I consider the best kind of editor, the best kind of editor, and then my favorite editors that I've worked through, worked with over 11 year, 11 books, not 11 years, but 11 books, have been the editors who ask me questions, right? They'll ask me a question about a story or a part of a story, and I have to think about it, but they don't tell me, change this or change that. Mm -hmm. And I and I've found that, these type of editors tend to be, um, well, I won't, I won't say, I won't say, I don't want to make a broad statement about other editors, but I, those are my favorite editors to work with. So we have a question from Neha, um, from Ailey. Is there a connection between the title of your collection and, quote, next year in Jerusalem, unquote, the Passover toast? Wow, I did not know that that was the Passover toast. So, um, not consciously, <laughs> but is it? Is it? Is that? Is next year in Jerusalem? What is that meant to be? Like a, a symbol of hope that in the like in the future, people will be in Jerusalem and it'll be. Does anyone want to explain? Nothing coming through the chat just yet. Okay. Neha. Neha's. Oh, and you can't Neha's can't Neha's unmute. Can you can you oh, put in? Can you type? Neha. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me let me. Uh, Neha's. On. Just a sec. There we go. Okay, I just unmuted Neha. Hi. Okay, first of all, really got to hear the conversation. <laughs> Fan girl squealing over here. Um, next year in Jerusalem is uh is something that that we say or people say that is uh, a hope that that next year we will be in our homeland well then that's exactly it that's exactly the same meaning it's like that tomorrow in shanghai means you're going to be in this safe home it's like it's not that shanghai is like any particular person's homeland per se but it's this cause for me it's this cosmopolitan space that has welcomed so many different kinds of people and has a very cosmopolitan um, attitude. And so that is what, that is my meaning is that tomorrow in Shanghai, you know, the characters will somewhere, they're not necessarily like literally Shanghai, but they will find that safe home, that safe space for themselves. Well, thank you for bringing that up. So I have a question now from Ariel. Any advice for channeling our experiences with marginalization into creative advocacy and resistance? Oh, awesome. Thank you, Ariel. That is a wonderful question. Um, I feel like this is actually um, like the thing that, that we, that the external gaze might think makes us weakest, right? is our various the thing the ways that we might be marginalized from the mainstream is actually in incredibly useful as a source of inspiration it's what gives us our vision it's what allows us to see 
the, to see the world that is being that was being kind of papered over, it allows us to pose the question that the mainstream does not ask, right? So I feel like it's a it's a tremendous opportunity to write from that position and write from that experience, both for creative work and then also absolutely in advocating for change and resistance in our society. It's not going to come from someone who has everything, right? We're looking at. Remember when Elon Musk reinvented the subway? And, they, and he, they, he spent a billion dollars and he came up with this plan and he says, cars will go underground. He created that big tunnel and it was one car at a time. And it's like, oh my God, right? Like he's not gonna be able to come up with that solution because he just doesn't have to. The solutions for climate change, the solutions for our, all the things that are existentially threatening us are going to come from these voices that we're not listening to right now. So thank you for that question, Ariel. I have a, a, another part to Ryan's question. Um, you said Trump stoked AAPI sentiment, but it was always there and never really went away. How do you keep the present moment and these historic trends in mind at the same time? Oh, age, Ryan, age. <laughs> I don't have to seek it out. I mean, it's just the present moment reminds me of that, of that history. Um, so, um, and then it was just a choice, like an editorial choice. Um, as I'm writing, do I want to set it now? Do I want to set it in the past? And then, you know, how much of this do I, you know, do I want to be really on point? Like in an essay, I can be very on point and, and actually give the literal connection. Um, but in a story, I, I usually, I start with a character. So I, I'm usually not quite as on point. I just want to see where that character in, in such a situation might take me. But thank you. Great question. May I interject or add something to that? Like, I, Please do. I really, mainly one of the things I, I've, gotten to know about you over uh, this you know, brief time that I've been your colleague is that you're actually very attentive to what is going on at the contemporary moment and attentive to how the contemporary moment is in fact inflected by history and what has happened before. And so I would argue that it's the or not even argue, but like to suggest that it's your um, focused study that is as much a part of how you allow your imagination to explore what else is possible or what is, but it's informed by focused study, engaged study. Um, and that it's not just, you know, you kind of staring into space, but it is you perhaps staring into space and saying, oh, I noticed this. How did this get there? Um, and that that seems to me really important to the, to the practice um, of being a writer, being an artist, um, any of that. Thank you for bringing that out. I think it is important. It is intentional, right? And we look at we look at the present moment with intention um, as a practice and think about these connections. And it's true. I mean, but I think I've got to the point where it also it does dovetail very much with my personality. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's it's you know for whatever reason, for whatever experiences it's you know in life, I I gravitate towards that. And then just in terms of my studies, you know, I did train as a historian and I did work as a journalist. And I think those two things are like you, the journalist has to keep a track of the present and the historian literally has to look into the past um, and find ways to uncover the records of the past. Well, but thank you for that question. We are coming up on the hour now. Um, I don't see any more questions. Let's see if there's any stragglers? No. Well, Meili Chai, Tanya Foster, ever grateful to you both for gracing our virtual halls. And, and it's such a great way to begin the fall season and, and such a compelling conversation. So really, thank you both so much. 
Um, thank you, Tanya. Thank you. This has been um, just such a delightful and insightful and interesting conversation um, with you. And thank you, Peter and City Lights. I just want to say, please, everyone, support City Lights. Order books from City Lights. If not ours, somebody's books, but support City Lights. And just in uh, in my favor, I will say, you, this City Lights is the only bookstore in America that has hand-signed copies of this book mm. with a hand stamped with my Chinese seal. Nice. So, so nowhere else can you get it but City Lights. So if you want one of those, you're going to have to get it, order it from City Lights. And also, thank you for inviting me, Meili, to engage in this conversation, to think about. I haven't thought about short stories in a long time and what they're doing. And it's, um, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, City Lights. Support independent bookstores. This is uh, this is the heart of the counterculture. This is the heart of resistance. Thank you, everyone, for coming and sharing in this joyful moment. The future will be better. The future will be better because we are making it so. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>